Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Her hair is so lovely. Pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 212 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Scott Stevens, I want to remind you about everything you'll find online at mistresscarrie.com. You'll find every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast and every episode of my weekly streaming video show, Cocktails in the War Room. You can read my blog, take a look at my concert and event calendar, send me a message right here in the studio, and shop in the online Mistress Carrie store. My guest this week is Scott Stevens, the lead singer of the band, The Exes. He's a songwriter and a producer, and known as one of the Four Horsemen, whose songwriting credits include songs with Shinedown, Hailstorm, Aaron Jones, Dorothy, Nothing More, Skillet, 6AM, Scott Stapp, Highly Suspect, Chris Daughtry, New Year's Day, and many more. And this Friday, June 28th, the Exes mark their return with their new six-song EP, Closure. Scott and I sat down to talk about musical influence and songwriting, Reuniting the Exes, working with some of the most badass women in rock, the brilliance of the Beatles, and he even pulled back the curtain a little bit to talk about songwriting and publishing royalties. Back on episode 187, I talked to fellow horseman Zach Malloy, and now this week, Scott Stevens is my second of the four horsemen who are helping to shape this new generation of rock stars. So allow me to introduce you to Scott Stevens. Hey. Hey. Uh, good morning, uh, Scott. I know you're on the West Coast, so it's very early. Cheers. I'm having my Cheers. coffee with you. Yes. Mm. <clears throat> I have my maintenance crew for what that comes once a week to help, you know, trim the, sh- the shrubs and, and, and the grass is, is here. So it's divine timing. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I have coffee with a lot of artists early in the morning because it's sometimes it's the only time you guys are available. How do you take your coffee? Well, usually, um, you know, it's just coffee, mate. French vanilla. I like, you know, a heavy pour in there. And I have about two of them. But I've been trying to get used to just having it straight black um, as it's, I guess, much healthier for you. But I'm I'm very much addicted to Coffee Mate's French vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> the chemicals are just it's, so good. It's my vice. It's my morning vice. Look, I get up and I exercise and I try to do the right things and I drink a healthy drink thing that I make every morning that smells like feet. It's awful. But <laughs> but I uh, this is my sugar, you know. Do you ever think that that rock would get to the point where it would become so healthy. It's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's so not rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's just, you know, one predisposed ideal of what it was supposed to always be. But and it, and it, to be honest, I mean, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing is a sexy, you know, lure. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess it bit me early on. I, you know, I don't think I did it necessarily uh i didn't do music in that order to put to put rock and roll last <laughs> you know put sex and drugs first but uh to each his own i suppose one of the things that that rock music i think has shown artists is that longevity of career is so possible and correct me if i'm wrong because i'm not a musician but 
when you go into music, I don't think Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Paul McCartney, any of those guys could have imagined decades and decades and decades later that they would still have such vibrant careers. So taking care of your physical health, you're not going to make it that long to have a career that long if you're not healthy. Yeah, I do think that it's probably something that did not occur to them early on. But as fame started and the the endurance of to have the endurance for fame, uh, somebody got smart pretty quick. Not Keith Richards, though. <laughs> <laughs> he is the exception to the rule in every instance. He is. And, and you know, God bless him, because it's kind of like. He is that thing that we were talking about. He kind of stands for that. Uh, he's the icon, you know. He, he stands above Lemmy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Look if you. Over. I don't know if you remember, but we met years and years ago when the Xies played shows for WAF in Boston. So yeah, I, talking I remember, about the longevity of your career, like back in the day. Yeah. I know. I re I remember you. I a lot of those days are uh, a blur. Like my my bass player Freddie, and Chris, who joined us later on um, in the evolution of the band, they remember every single thing. I mean, I don't know how that's possible, but they do. I I I remember pieces. But yes, I do remember, and I loved being in Boston. I loved playing in Boston. Um, I can't remember that first place we played. It kind of was a it was kind of a, wasn't it kind of like a, a narrower, I can't remember the See, If Freddie was sitting here, he'd, he'd be like, it was this. So, um, but I loved playing in Boston. It sounds like you're describing the Middle East. Low ceiling, it, in the basement, yeah. super sweaty. That's it. Yeah. That place I love those is iconic. Hell yeah. Still going, that place? Yeah. Yeah, everybody's played there. Like, you, you can't be a rock band and at one point or another, not have played the Middle East in Cambridge. Like you just, you, that means you didn't cut your teeth. Yeah. I, I guess that, then I guess we did cut our teeth because we played there. I think we played there maybe more than once. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I can't remember. But I remember we got to play a big place there too with Bell Revolver in Boston, like the arena. So oh, that was great. Was that at, uh, in, uh, was it the Aganis Arena? Wherever Velvet Revolver played, we opened for them. Yeah, there. I remember that show. Yeah. I that I, was awesome. I interviewed Scott Weiland around that time, and, and uh, he was not having a good day. We got into a famous fight. One of the only fights I've ever gotten into with an artist in my entire career. Was, no way. Yeah, yeah. What was it about? I... I had just gotten back from being an embedded reporter in Iraq. Oh, wow. And he had said something on stage about the war or something. And I brought it up saying, I just came back from there. I got embedded as a journalist and actually went there to like see what was going on, got embedded with troops from Massachusetts. And he and I kind of got into it a little bit because he didn't believe some of the things I was saying to him that I had seen. Right, and sure. So we got into it a little bit, and it was like, I can't believe I'm fighting with Scott Weiland right now because <laughs> I was such a huge fan. And I know, yeah, I know in hindsight, it was, you know, he was just having a day. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, and maybe he was speaking, you know, he was probably ignorant to that can be such a weird, bad word sometimes, you know. But it, 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 he just ignorant to the to the to what it is that you were witnessing firsthand, and uh, him disputing that. Yes, maybe the chemicals were talking. Um, I don't know how you dispute that when you have somebody that has like sees it firsthand. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I guess. But I remember <laughs> it is what that. It is. I remember that tour for sure. Yeah, I only saw Scott Weiland once the whole time I was on that tour, um, and that was the very last day. <laughs> of our of our stint with them and uh you know he looked very frail it was very sad you know i i i'm sure it's talked about a lot still but being there firsthand and witnessing how he was escorted on stage and how he was escorted off stage uh was it, it, it was like he was in jail you know um 
two people on each side of him, rushing him up to the stage and pulling him off, putting him in a car, and off he went, arriving in a car and on stage. There was no uh, camaraderie or social life with his band or a high five and here we go, let's take on the world. At least from what I saw, I mean, we were only out with him for like maybe two and a half, three weeks. And I just, that was all I remember. And then I remember seeing him, he had a bright red hair dye and he had his, his eyebrows were being dyed. So he had big, thick black, like dye on his eyebrows. So he looked like Groucho Marx meets Johnny Rotten. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just like, thanks for the tour fellas. And and that was the last, you know, then of course, years later he, he passed away. But uh, I remember Slash was really cool. And Duff was really cool. Matt Sorum was really cool to us. Um, Dave, is that the other guy? It was a guitar player. Yeah, they were, they watched us and, you know, especially Duff. He was really, he, he was supportive. Well, we got talking in this conversation about health and longevity of career. And unfortunately, there are a lot of stories of brilliant musicians whose careers were cut short for what whatever reasons. And you're just kind of left to wonder what if, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Look, you know, I mean, there are bands that look at like Creed, you know, I know Scott personally. And I mean, they've, they stuck around and they're all still here and now they're having this huge thing. And yeah, you, you wonder uh, what would happen if, if Wyland took a hiatus and then they came back and STP formed right now, it'd be huge. It'd be amazing, you know? But not to not to be, not to be. One of the benefits of having longevity of career on my side of the business is being able to watch the bands that I love so much and how these careers have changed. And I bring it up because you are the second horseman I've had on the show. Um, I talked to Zach Malloy recently, who I got to know from the early days of the Nixons. Yeah. And to see... What you guys as a collective have done to rock and roll. I feel like I talked to you yesterday because every time I talk to a band, your name comes up, the horsemen come up, Nashville comes up. Like yeah. I might as well just move into your basement because <laughs> every band that I play on the radio and interview on the show, you guys have your fingers in it somehow. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really incredible how that all happened. Um, you know, I I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not usually that guy, but I'm I'll take credit for coming up with the name. And um and it was literally a joke. Uh I've told this story I think a few times where my publishing was becoming available, Zach's was becoming available. Blair Daly's was becoming available and Marty's was available. And I made some joke about, Hey, there's uh, you know, the four of us here, we've been in the game for a minute and all of our publishing is available. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a publisher who had wanted to invest in the four of us. And, um, and I, and I said, we'll call ourselves the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Ha ha ha. And then COVID hits <laughs> and it becomes this, you know, phone calls. And, uh, you know, within a few months, those phone calls turned into, you know, um, I think I think Zach went over in a mask to Marty's house because I was in L.A. and nobody was going anywhere. And we started drafting through through the Internet first. We started drafting like what it would look like. And then we they got together and did something uh, that I can't re really remember, but, um, and then we started kind of quietly shopping it. And before 2020 was over, we, we got somebody that really was passionate about it. And the rest of it was history. I mean, we were all of a sudden, we were the four of us and we started zooming, you know, like this thing that you and I are doing. I remember that was what is zooming and writing over zoom. What is that? You know, I don't <laughs> want to do that, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> but then, and that's how I started writing new Xyz music because I, I refused to do Zoom for a few months. And um, but once we started doing it, we just started, you know, that transferred all those Zoom sessions transferred over into finally doing live sessions. I remember my very first one was Aaron Jones. And I came to Nashville 
and I got in the room and Marty and I and Aaron and we all had our masks on. And that was the first in-person session in over a year. And we wrote Mercy. And that was the, the song that went number one. So it was, I remember thinking like, mm, this might work. Like that was, that's a, maybe this is some kind of omen, good omen, you know, like, Hey, we just sat and wrote a song that went number one after being cooped up for you know a year plus, and uh, and then we just started collaborating, you know, um, on everything together. What are you working on this week? Who you, who are you talking to? Well, I got this, and I got Dorothy coming in, and uh, you know, I, want, I got Daughtry and Lizzie Hale, and you know, and it just started, you know, it just started doing that, and 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 sometimes the four of us would write on something, and sometimes it would just be two of us. Um, but for the most part, it would be the four of us on any given record. Probably half the record would be us co-writing with the artists. So it became a lot of songs really quickly. Hundreds <laughs> in the span of a couple of years. Aaron's been on the show a few times and I couldn't I love-, love him more. I love his sound. I love the vibe of the shows. I, I love the combination and the flavors of his music. And as you're rattling off artists, I'm like, Dorothy, yep, she came on the show and talked about you guys. Lizzie Hale, yep, she came on the show and talked about you guys. Daughtry, yep, he came on the show and talked about you guys. <laughs> I told you, I might as, just build me a studio in <laughs> your office building so that I can just be part of this mechanism now because I'm going to end up talking to all your bands anyway. Yeah, that's right. We're a team. Uh, you'll get the inside s- scoop as as how things go and how they're how they're written and, what, and who we're working with before the world knows about it. Um, yeah, it, it's it's an amazing thing, you know. And we're always whether we're under the same publishing umbrella, it doesn't matter. We we bonded over that time, and and we'll always work together. I mean, I just finished. Uh, I just finished producing the Dorothy record, um, and you know the Horseman. We were, it was, I set up these sessions for us in Nashville and I think we got like 10 songs in a week and not everything was flushed out. You know, I got a lot of heavy lifting to do when I get back home and sorting out the arrangement and then sometimes doing a zoom and going, okay, the bridge, let's write the bridge. Cause it's not done yet. And, and Dorothy will either zoom in with me from San Diego or she'll be here and we would split our day. You know, she's cutting vocals, uh, and then half the day we're just zooming and kind of you know writing lyrics and figuring out what chord you know what chords are working and and that kind of thing, um, you know and and yeah that that was this this album is a huge 4H contribution you know um, whereas like the Daughtry record is is half of us it's Marty and I um, but that's kind of how Chris wants to keep it you know he just he wants to keep it tight but that's not to say that the other that Zach and Blair won't get songs on it or it, it could happen. Um, it's just how how it's going currently. Is we're only halfway through on that one. So, one of the things I love about having people like you on the show, I think, as music fans, we hear a lot of terms in the news. Right, we're always talking about music catalogs that are getting sold. The rumor that Sony is going to buy Queen for a billion dollars, but I think that there are a lot of music fans that that might not understand kind of what publishing is. So yeah. do you mind just for a second kind of breaking down when you talk about publishing and writing? Because the way that the music industry is now, it's not just writing an album, recording it, and like selling the album. That like the portions of ownership are different depending on the term. So do you mind kind of breaking that down to explain it for people that don't understand? Yeah, I mean the simplest way to 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 talk about publishing is if you're looking at a whole, which is a hundred percent, the song being a hundred percent, who was involved in the writing of that song, lyrics, melodies, chords. If there are three of us in the room and we're contributing, most ninety nine point nine percent of the time, you'll split it in thirds. If it's Dorothy and I sitting here working on a song, even if she came up with more of it or if I came up with more of it, it takes the two of us to finish it. We split it 50-50. There are some instances where 
in pop music and even in some in country. I don't know that it really exists in rock, but if I write a hundred percent of a song, um, more than likely, like if let's just say Carrie, Carrie into it, or I don't know, I'm just spouting off. And she says, I'm going to take that song, but she didn't write it, but she's going to give life to it. Like Elvis Presley would do. Elvis Presley didn't write songs, but he made, he made these songs come to life in a way. Um, I don't know if he got publishing or not, but let's just go with all things being percentages of who contributed. Elvis would not get publishing, but the writers that wrote the song would. And Elvis would benefit from other things, touring, merchandise, you know, everything that comes from those songs is goes to, goes to Elvis, not to the writers. The writers are, we are basically just bound to the song itself and the percentages of the song. And that's how many people in the music business, they make their money because they, uh, you know, the song goes out on a record or it goes out on the radio and it's what they call a mechanical, right? And and that's when it gets played on the radio or that's when it gets, you know, and that, that, those stations and those things and platforms all over the world, they have to pay, Spotify has to pay, Tidal has to pay, you know, uh, 98 Rock has to pay a little bit of money to, to, to license this song to be able to play it. And those fractions of whatever it is money-wise get split up into those percentages of people that wrote on those songs. We call it mailbox money. And depending on how big your song gets, your checks increase. And for how long it's on the air is also how much money you will make. Maybe you might make $10,000, $100,000, $200,000 over a song over 10 years. Or it could be, you know, because it's still played on the radio. But if you hit a, like a Megan Trainer pop song, you could, and it goes all over the world, it becomes number one, you'll make millions of dollars um, quickly, maybe not over time, <laughs> you know, because it just goes boom. And that, and that has a massive propulsion of uh, what they call spins, you know, like the stations that spin the pop songs around the world are in the tens of thousands of spins, whereas the rocks are in thousands, but not tens of thousands. And so, you know, it all makes different kinds of income. And but all things being relative, you know, you can you can either write one pop song and and get the publishing on that and and maybe you can retire if you get lucky on one song, but for the most part, most people I know um like myself, we just we we take our percentage. It's usually either a third, 25 or 20%. Sometimes you're lucky if you get 50% because there's usually more than one person in the room. And you just collect those nickels and pennies and those, and you just got to keep turning out songs. And, and uh, it's just like you working at a job. It's, it's your, it's your wage, you know? And so in the, in, in the essence that writing is very blue collar in, and, and it's, and it's publishing structure is very blue collar. Um, you, you love songwriting, you love music for the sake of loving it. Can you make a living at it? Hopefully if your songs are good enough and you've got, with the right artists that are helping to make those songs come to fruition. Um, you can make a living on it. You might not get rich. Don't do it for that reason. Do it because it's what you do, you know, and you'll have your moments where you met, you might make a lot of money from it. And then you'll have your dry moments as well. And I've experienced all of it <laughs> over the years. So, but I'm a lifer. This is what I do. It's, it's all I know. Um, and it's what I love to do. I get up and I, the, I get up and I strum chords right in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and try to write little ideas and I put them in my phone or you know on my laptop and and when I'm in the room with Chris Dotra, I go, "What about this?" You know, or Lizzie Hale, "What do you think about this?" I got this title. It's called "Back from the Dead," you know, <laughs> and uh, and we write it and and that that and then it becomes what we all listen to, hopefully. Does that help? Did that make sense? Yes, hundred percent. And there's a great example. Speaking of Elvis, I think for me is the most famous example, and it's Dolly Parton, the OG gangster herself, because Elvis wanted to do "I Will Always Love You," and she was a newbie in the songwriting game. Yeah, and they told her he wouldn't do the song without the publishing, 
And uh-huh. Dolly, as a as a nobody songwriter, turned down Elvis and wouldn't give him the publishing. He didn't cover the song. She released the song, obviously, and it was a moderate hit for her. But had yeah. she not had the balls as Dolly Parton to tell Elvis no, the Whitney Houston money would have never come. Exactly. Yeah, that was some kind of divine <laughs> timing there. Because, uh, you yeah, know, definitely Whitney was the one, the vehicle, as I call it sometimes, to just take that song global. You know, Dolly's intent and her lyric, uh, her chords, the way that song feels is right on the money. It, it, Whitney's be- the version doesn't exist without Dolly. But Whitney, it just knocked that thing to Mars. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, the first time I heard that, I was like, wow. I mean, that's unbeatable, you know? And so, yeah, it happens. It happens. One of the other things that comes up on the show a lot, and for a woman like me that that broke into my side of the business during the height of new metal in the 90s, is that I, most of the time, was the only woman on the air staff, the only woman at the station, the only woman backstage at the shows. I could never have imagined women's place in rock today. And when I talked to Zach... We were talking about it because I feel like every other week there's a different woman on my show, which I never could have imagined. And Zach was like, you know what? Like women in rock, we're there. Come on, ladies. Yeah. This is what we do. And I feel like for me, having been around for a while, I couldn't have imagined that there would be this many women. I couldn't have imagined that there would be a team of men like the horsemen that were doing such justice to women in the industry the way that you guys are. And I really feel like it's this whole new kind of era in rock and roll because of it. Yeah, I I feel so fortunate for what has happened from Lizzie and Ash Costello and Lilith and Dorothy and Maria Brink um to all come into this studio here this little room that i have here in in la and trust in me to help write songs with them um and it's it's been brought up a few times and i think out of the horsemen i've probably worked with the most women but um we all do it and we all are huge supporters of of women in rock i don't think there's enough of them um, you know, when you look at the country charts, there's like three women out of like 50 guys. I mean, it should be a little more even, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, you know, how about another 10 women, you know, in country? Uh, is that going to really upset the apple cart? I don't know. Um, but in rock, oh, and like Amanda, you know, from Eve Under Fire and, you know, like it just... It started with, I think it started for me with the fact that I was raised by three women. I didn't, my father and my mother divorced when I was two. So being passed around to two aunts and my mom really, and they all had really great musical taste. And and I think being, you know, you're going to your aunts for the summer <laughs> in Tennessee, you know, uh, that that really did something to my uh you know to my collaboration and understanding of women and 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 how to get in touch with that um as obviously being raised by them i'm probably more in touch with my feminine side of our you know creativity than i am with the 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 testosterone side of of it well they are it is in there but it definitely leans uh towards the feminine feminine side a little bit more which is why I think when I first met Lizzie Hale, like we we hit it off so well and have written so many songs together, um, you know, from Miss the Misery and Amen and Apocalyptic and Back from the Dead and The Steeple and Miss Hyde and and yeah, I Like It Heavy and all these songs that we've written together, it all kind of started there. And that helped 
for at least for me as a horseman, that that helped broaden. That got me Ash, and then I I wrote this record with Ash right here. Yeah, this is the that, Unbreakable record. I love that you have all your vinyl up on the wall behind you. It's always yeah. interesting to see how you guys decorate your workspaces. Yeah, I kind of I, I I swap them out too as new records come in and you know, and I and it just makes for great wall. I I can't take credit for this. I I, I saw it at the Guggenheim in uh, New York. And they had a wall full of records. And I was like, I'm taking that idea. <laughs> I'm putting it right here. So, yeah. And there's like Hailstorm, two records there. And got nothing more here. Dorothy up there, Biters, Shine Down. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it started like that. And then Lilith and I got together. And I remember we were having a, a hard time. And we wrote a song called King together and once that kind of started then anarchy came with zach and blair and i and lilith in nashville and that day was magical you know and you know, then i had maria here and we were messing around and i made a joke about white wedding billy idol and we we wrote black wedding you know and rob halford got on that song and um and and you know it's still i think it just went gold you know she just called me last week and said the song just went gold and that's an amazing thing, you know, and I I just feel so lucky to to be able to be trusted by them. And I know the guys do as well. We we just had an amazing time with Dorothy and the record is so good and she's a beast and I can't wait for the world to hear it. Um, And, you know, she she and I are close friends now, too. And that's the other great thing that comes out of all of this is I just talked to Lizzie and Joe yesterday, you know, and. Just like we, you know, once you, once you, once you write as many songs and you get deep in the mud, you know, it's like your friends forever, you know? So, um, you know, you, you hope that these songs, you know, these songs, they mark a time for you and, um, and hopefully they last, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing what's happened with, and we're here for more. I know plush Zach and Blair just worked on them and, you know, like it's, like you said, like, ladies, come on, we'll, we'll help you where you need it, you know? I have a theory about music, and I know that you and I have a very common thread with what I'm about to say. It's two parts, this is my theory, that there's the soundtrack to your childhood, the music that gets thrust upon you by your parents and your aunts and uncles and all of that, and then you hear something as an adolescent that makes you say, I like that. And from then on, your musical identity is yours. And yeah. from what I know about you, you and I share the Beatles as the soundtrack to our childhood in a lot of ways. And I always say that the greatest gift my mom ever gave me was the gift of the Beatles and my love of music comes from her. Yeah, absolutely we do. And that's 100% accurate. I'll never forget being like five years old or six years old. And I was in the backyard. It was summertime in Colorado and I was running into the house and my mom yelled at me, stop. And I was, and I was, you know, what? <laughs> you know? And she goes this part. And she was doing the dishes. I'll never forget this. And she goes, she came in through the bathroom window. And she sang that part with such like passion and I just watched her as as the, I watched the music just take her away. And it was in that moment that I, I think I felt what music does to somebody once they know it and they and they really feel it. And and I never forgot that. And it was just that moment made me start to pay attention to, you know, the Beatles and her music more and she played it constantly, you know, and it was, it was, it became the Bible for me. I mean, it was, to me, they were the greatest at melodies and chord changes and lyrical concepts. And some people could say it was teeny bopper and it started out that way, but it, it, it matured beautifully and it always had such a great energy to it. And, and it lifted you above your life and let you do what my mom did. Just get like into that moment where you're just like, you're not even you. <laughs> you're just kind of you're just one with it you know and that that was a very lasting impression on me still to this day you know and yes the Beatles are my main influence for sure isn't it crazy how you have such a vivid memory of a snapshot of your life 
for me, it was a Monday night. My dad was home watching the Patriots on Monday night football. Mm -hmm. My mom and one of her girlfriends were going to run to a department store, took me with her. And we're in the store. And over the loudspeaker in the store, they announced that John Lennon had been killed. Oh, wow. And I remember standing in this department store and my mom and her best friend started crying. And I didn't understand because I was a kid. I didn't understand what was going on. And... I couldn't figure out at the time why they were so sad that someone died that they didn't know. Because I was so young that I couldn't understand. And now as I've obviously gotten older and obviously music plays such a huge role in my life and lost amazing artists that helped to shape my musical identity, I completely obviously understand it now, but back then I was just a kid going, I don't understand why my mom is so sad that someone died that she didn't even know. And that moment I will never forget. And I was a kid. Yeah. It's because that the music affects us in such a way at times in our, in, in our lives, you know, where we remember we, we start to associate these periods of our life with songs. They're, they become this backdrop. And uh, it's like sometimes, you know, how you walk into a place and you can smell something and all of a sudden, whoosh, you just, you go back in time like fast. You're in, it's a smell that you have in smell or it reminds you of something. And I think sometimes songs do that. I'll see, I'll put on a, a, a I'll put on a vinyl or I'll put on or look at a record sometimes and go, oh, and it hurts my, hurts me because it's from it's so far from the past you know and it's but it's so good but i'm almost afraid to listen to it (laughs) because the there's joy there but there's also pain like so much time has passed you know and i don't know maybe that's just me but it's it's uh yeah music can hurt sometimes too because of because of your passion for it what was it that you heard in your adolescence that made you that, that changed your musical identity. Do you remember? Was it an artist, a song, an album? What was it that you said, I like that? That's what I like. Um, I mean, I think that there were, I think one of the, the moments that I, I liked all my mom's music. I remember, th- you know, starting to get into, when I remember when Guns N' Roses hit, I was like, Wow. Um, that's like Aerosmith because I knew Aerosmith because my, my aunt, the first thing she ever, you know, record, I think the first record that I ever had was a record she bought for me. It was, uh, Toys in the Attic. And I just remember Guns N' Roses as I was, you know, getting older now and, and like starting to discover what my music would be. I thought they were great and that they had a dangerous kind of street rat gutter vibe going on and they reminded me of a dirty aerosmith you know um um they just had the right look and the sound and all of it it just it seemed perfect um but i do remember when the first time i heard alice in chains facelift that record i was like what is that and and then i heard uh nirvana after that and started like the grunge scene and i went i went to a a club here in la i don't even know how old i was 19 or 20 and and it was like i uh allison chains was coming through and playing this small place and there's this band that was opening for them they were called mookie blaylock and that turned into pearl jam And and i was like totally mouth on the floor like what am i watching what kind of music is this that i'm hearing you know and and even though i knew that allison chain but watching it live and with jerry and lane singing the way they were and the guitar sound and eddie vader kind of shaking his head and looking up at the ceiling and i was just like what is this like some voodoo camp you know (laughs) like what's going on here you know and it just it was life-changing it really grabbed me and moved me. And I, there again, I, I, I heard the similarities that Kurt had with the Beatles. He he was molesting them in the best way. And uh, 
you know, he just, he made, he made the Beatles get dirtier, you know, um, but he still had the chord progressions and the melodies that sounded like John Lennon, you know, to me. Um, and I think that was part of their charm to a younger generation who didn't really know completely, like that that's what it was. It just was melodically satisfying as all hell. Didn't matter that the the lyrics didn't make much sense because it didn't, you know, it just was more of a observations and feelings, but it, it, it sure sounded important. <laughs> it comes up all the time that Rick Rubin, Paul McCartney docuseries that they did as a lifelong mm-hmm. Beatles fan and someone that grew up with it in the house the way that you did. It was that show when Paul McCartney explained that the beauty of the Beatles was the cynicism of John Lennon and the happiness of Paul McCartney and the happiness of the music and the, the cynicism of the lyrics or the cynicism of the music and Paul McCartney's happy lyrics on that. It was that combination that made them so brilliant. And I, I was watching that during COVID, right? I had never thought about it before. And when he explained it that way, my brain just oozed out of my ear and I was like, Oh my God. Yeah, that, that's it. They nailed it in one song. It's getting better all the time. It couldn't get much worse. <laughs> that's John. That's Paul and John in nailed down all those songs into one song. Paul McCartney, positive. It's getting better all the time. John Lennon. It couldn't get much worse. There's the sinister. Yeah, you know, that, that's beautiful. That, that explains it all. <laughs> that's it. You don't need to look any further to any other songs than that one. That's it. I ask songwriters all the time on the show. And for somebody that literally makes a living writing songs, it could be an impossible task for you. Oh my God. Are you saging your studio right now? I love it. I'm saging the studio. I'm smudging. I grow it in my backyard. I have a garden right outside my studio window out there and I grow it. There you go. Mighty joint. (laughs) I was like, okay, are you trying to act like Snoop over there? That's a massive joint, but no, you're saging the studio. Um, I always ask songwriters this question and it's a craft question to give me an example of a song that is perfectly crafted, a song that is so well written that you wish you wrote it. Is there one you can name and break down why you think it's so brilliant of any artist, any genre, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that many of the Beatles songs are perfectly crafted songs. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, even song like if you go, if you go like to eight days a week, it's a pop, silly little pop song. The chords and the way it moves and it constantly repeats, but never gets old. It's brilliant. Um, you know, she loves you. It, there's another one. I want to hold your hand or like, you know, uh, uh, star standing there, you know, there's just something about those songs that just, they just work so well. And then you got things like, you know, black hole sun that are just flawless to me, you know, in, in all their imperfections and, um, you know, Amy Winehouse songs, you know, back to black and like even rehab being the commercial, they're just they're done so beautifully um i couldn't name just one song i mean elton john rocket man i mean it's like that's a timeless classic it's uh that song hurts kind of when i hear it because it's just so beautifully put together um or like benny and the jets or uh you know i don't know you know just a lot of that stuff off a of honky talk chateau carol king songs like i mean and james taylor when he sings you know Sweet baby, you know, like it just, it's like, huh? It just sounds like God rock or something. It's just perfect. As somebody that writes songs, because Elton John and Bernie Toppin get talked about with songwriters on my show all the time. Have you ever heard of anyone else ever writing songs the way that Elton and Bernie do? No, I haven't. I'm sure it it gets done, though, um, quite a bit. I mean, I think Hal David and Burt Bacharach were that way. But look, they there's I mean, their songs are huge, right? Raindrops keep falling on my head and that kind of stuff. And what the world needs now, that shit. He was a lyricist. So yeah, I believe there are a lot of lyricists out there that don't sing melodies and they need these 
these muses, you know, these people that know how to interpret those lyrics and give it a feeling. That seems like the harder part to me. Um, writing that because the melody is what we all hear. I don't care who you are. When you hear something for the first time, you're not able to digest every single lyric as it's going down. You you can hear them sometimes, but you do miss a lot of words. Uh, you're you're feeling the melody first and the chords and the intent of what is happening. Then the lyric comes into play, and the lyric is what makes the melody glide, as I say. Because you can go da 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 da, da but it, until you go, she was just. 17 you know what i mean then now it's now it's moving and so it's usually melody first lyric second and when the lyric is right the melody glides and it becomes what we all can relate to or see ourselves in in some way so i do think that there are a lot out there but i don't think there's as many as successful as those two <laughs> it's timeless with the successful career that you have working with every artist that's come on my show ever what was it that made you go, I think I'm going to put the X's back together and work on my own music now? Was it just, I want to cram one more thing into my day? Was it because <laughs> you missed the performance side of it yourself? What was it? Well, look, Carrie, I'm glad you asked this question and you're going to be the first one to hear this. I mean, when this started to happen for me, I don't know why it did. Um, I know that COVID was partly responsible because of con confinement and boredom and also then worry uh, of like, what is this? Not only for me, for my family, for friends, like, is this us now in a bubble and this is life and this is, you know, because now it's, we're many months into this and it doesn't seem like it's letting up anytime soon. I'm I'm, I'm going to miss Christmas this year with something I always go home for, you know, Um but when I did hatch the very first ideas that are starting to now trickle out, I had such anxiety. I had such night terror, stomach ache. What the hell? What am I doing? Why do I want to even do this um, moments in my sleep for months and months and months? And that's no lie. It was torturous. And, and I, tried to figure out why why would I want to put myself through what I've what I've already done I've already gone past it already and uh, a song you know revealed itself to me sad which I just released a couple of weeks ago was the first one from covid and because you know the, the lyric is in there is uh, you know I'm 7 days in and I'm trying to cope and then the next chorus I'm 7 months in and I'm just trying to figure it out. And then the last course is I'm seven years and I'm just trying to figure out what the F's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first song that made me go, okay, it's like a diary. It's therapeutic. I'm going to just write it to write it. And because I'm not writing with anybody, I'm not zooming yet. You know, th this isn't really happening. And I got, I got so far on that song to the point where I couldn't finish it. And um, it was a day just like, like today. And I remember I sat down in the morning and I started going. For anybody that, so it's weird that, that was, your, your, your microphone, the way it works, it doesn't pick up the guitar. Oh, it doesn't pick it up. No. Okay. So what I was just doing was uh, I was just playing these, these four chords and that turned into this song called spirits high. And that was the song that I tried to become more of the optimist, even though I felt like uh, I was very stuck. And when that song got finished, I felt like something, all the pain that I was feeling, the anxieties, all of it somehow was being released through that. And, and it almost feels like, you know, I walked up to, I could go up to my parents and go, you want to know what's going on in my life? Here's my diary. Whereas you would never do that, you know? And I was like, here's what's happening. And I, I was working on it here in the studio and my, my wife came in and she surprised me. I thought she was going to be gone for a couple of hours. She didn't know I was doing any music. I didn't tell her. 
So we're, we're going on months and months and I'm working on things and I don't tell her and, and I tell her everything. And it's, she came back in cause she forgot something and the door was open. She came in and she goes, I forgot. And da, 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 da. And, 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 and I pushed the space bar, you know, like, like I had been caught doing something I shouldn't be doing, you know? And she goes, what's that? I go, nothing. <laughs> it's like every nothing. guy's nightmare that the wife comes home unexpected because yep. he's got like the neighbor's wife in the back room or something. And you're like, I'm recording music. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like nothing. And she goes, what is it? Play it. And and I hit the space bar and it was the chorus. And, and, uh, <laughs> and she's like, wow, that sounds just like the X's. I mean, that sounds like the X's. And I was like, it does, doesn't it? It's, it's, this is crazy. She's like, when did you start doing this? And I said, well, like five months ago, <laughs> like that, six months ago, you know, and, uh, and I just, you know, it, it wasn't finished either. And so I just kind of started to finish it and work on it. And a few other ideas started to come in and they all, and I would just kind of bounce around and today I can finish the verse on this one because it's just letting me finish it, you know, and. Uh, there was no thought to me releasing any of this stuff. It was just finishing it here. And it was so much fun to kind of go back in time and and listen to the old songs and go, you know, how would we do this, you know, and da 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 And it just started to come to fruition in a way that it was Christmas. And I and I I called my management company and I just said, uh, I'll never forget this. They were on their way to go see Shine Down at uh, Wembley Arena. They were all in the in the in the van or whatever it was. And I was talking to Bill, my manager, uh, Bill McGathy, and he said, what, what what's going on, Scott? And I said, Well, you're busy. You're going to see Shine Down. You can call me. He goes, no, tell me, because I got the whole crew in here. We're all we're, said I'm gonna release the first XC song in 16 years. <laughs> and he's like, What? And I said, I'm I'm i I've, I've got to do it. I've got a song, it's finished. And he's like, Well, wait a minute. How are you going to release it? I said, I don't know, through like CD Baby or TuneCore. And Allison Shepard chimed in, who is the head of marketing there. She goes, don't do that. <laughs> you know, let us help you figure out how to get this out properly. You know, it doesn't need a label, but you just need a proper platform to put it out on. So they helped me. And on, uh, you know, on January 27th of 2023, I released it. And that was the first, I was nervous. Um, but as the, uh, I woke up, uh, in the morning, I woke up to all these, you know, Instagram and, and Twitter, uh, messages from people from Sweden and France and Russia and Australia and all, all over the world were, and they were doing YouTube reviews already on it. And, uh, you know, and it, it, I think it got a hundred thousand streams in a few days and, and I, I couldn't believe what was happening. And I don't think anybody else could, I don't think my management company, I don't think anybody realized that there was still a need maybe, or a want, not a need, but a want to hear music from this band that had been gone for 16 years and was very encouraging. So, you know, I started to work on the other songs um, and start to put, you know, finish them. And my, 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 Den uh, my drummer, Dennis um, took me to dinner um, and he just said that new song is really good. I really like it. And I, thanks, man. Thanks. And he said, we should play some shows and we should, we should do something. And, and I said, okay, I don't know really if I wanted to do that, you know, and, um, hold on. Oh, there you are. And I was like, I don't know if I really want to do that. And we let a couple more months go by and he was pretty persistent in saying, no, we should do it. We should do it. And finally, I think it was June of last year. And, and I said, look, uh, if we're going to do it, how are we going to do it? He goes, well, you got to make some phone calls. I'm like, I got to make phone calls. You're the one that wants to do this. <laughs> you know, you got to make the phone calls. He's like, no, you're the singer. You got to make the phone call. So I called Freddie who's in Everclear, you know, he's in Everclear. And, uh, he said, yeah, I would love to, to do a reunion show and that'd be fun. And, and then I called Chris Skane because unfortunately that year, um, you know, a few days, a few weeks before I released the song, our guitar player at that time, David Walsh, which I don't know if you remember meeting him, but he passed away. And um, it was it was very sad to release that song and have him not hear it and be a part of it because he knew about it. Um, as I asked him if he wanted to finish that song with me, um, 
but he didn't have any interest in really doing that. So, you know, he was at a different place in his life and just didn't really want to do the band thing again. And so um, I finished it on my own, but it was, yeah, it was, uh, you know, after that, after getting through all of that and then, and, and talking about it, we, we, we decided that we would start rehearsing and, and Freddie said, I can't do anything until October. And Dennis was like, what? It's June. He's like, I'm touring, you know? So uh, we got together our first, you know, rehearsal in October. Um, and I, I taped the whole thing on my phone. Um, so I've got us hugging each other first time in 15, 16 years. And we went to mates, which is where we used to rehearse uh, back in the day. And, um, and we started and we did nine rehearsals between then and the reunion show, which just happened like two weeks ago. Um, and it was incredible. Terry, I wish you could have been there. I mean, it was, it was nothing but love. We packed it. Uh, you know, the people couldn't get in um, outside and everybody sang every lyric to every song loud, every song. And we played 15 tracks or 13 tracks, something like that, an hour. And people flew in from everywhere. They were from Kentucky and they were from New York and from Florida and from Dallas and from Minnesota and Ohio and Colorado. And I mean, it was, they were from everywhere. Um, it was very touching. It was hard not to be emotional. Um, but the fucking night rocked. And, and we, a lot of people came up to us and said, what are you going to do now? You know, so no, no gigs are booked yet, but we are, we're talking about it. So you have the, the exclusive on that. I mean, it's, it's in the works. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> Bring us to Boston. So what is the, what's the future for all of this new music? Are you going to do a traditional full album release? Are you going to release singles? Is this you know, is the band officially back together and, and moving forward? Or is this, uh, like, like, am I asking questions you guys are still trying to figure out the answers to? We're still trying to figure out the answers to some of this. What we are going to do is there is an EP going to be released on June 28th. That's in, like, what, uh, nine days. Um, and it's called Closure. And the reason it's called Closure is at the time that I was telling you earlier about me writing all these songs, literally, I, I think I had like between, I don't know, maybe 10 and 12, 14 ideas floating around in my phone. Um, these six were the first to get done. They felt like the chapters. I was kind of equating closure to parallel, a, a loose parallel to the five stages of grief where uh, you know, which in the next week I'm going to start to talk about on my socials of like, you know, closure obviously is acceptance, you know, the last part of, of the five stages of grief, because I was uh, saying goodbye to the exes. Um, this is COVID allowed me to be, to get back into that time. And I, and I did these songs, which are all three and four years old. And, um, you know, I just, I needed closure. I needed to say goodbye and to move on to it now as it somehow was possessing my soul again. And uh, and now I look at it as, well, the, the gig was amazing. The goodwill is starting to happen. You know, maybe it's just closure. It's just that chapter is just one door has to close for this next adventure to happen. And such is life, right? How poetic. It's, um, so there are more songs. I am working on them. Um, Freddie and I, uh, Freddie cut the last, uh, he cut this, there's a song called The Hill that's coming out and Freddie got in there with me the last uh, couple weeks before mastering and put his bass on that. So that's, it rocks. And yeah, I mean, we've started talking about recording together again now and, and moving forward with a uh, an EP that would you know constitute maybe making a full album you know, with this first six, then another six. Um, again, it's all just talk right now, but it's good. Things are happening, you know. Uh, radio just picked up for what it's worth and is starting to play it. Um, and we did this really cool video for it. Uh, like, it's the, it's 20 years of us playing shows. And, and I'm, I'm sure that Boston is, I know Boston's in that, in that video because I saw the mini DVs as I was digitizing them 
going into the computer, we had those shows, you know, and, and they're all a part of it. We had an editor put it all together and it made me very, so sentimental to see all that old footage. Oh my God, it wrecked me <laughs> to see that. <laughs> it wrecked me, man. It's just like, wow, that's wow. So much time has gone on. And look what look at all the stuff we've done. Like I didn't even remember all of it, you know? And I think a lot of people that are just discovering us are like, you guys were kind of big. You're playing lots of big places. And I was like, yeah, I mean, we played our last show was in front of 60,000 people in Russia, you know, and that's in that thing, like the third or fourth shot, you see all these lights and things and that's us in Russia playing, you know? So it's, it's kind of crazy. I don't know what it, I don't know what this is, Carrie. I don't, I'm not good. I don't have any expectations. I'm just putting one foot in front of the next and one trying to finish and write these songs and just, see what this what happens and we're going to release this ep and there's things in the works that i can't really talk about yet but like it just it's something's happening and it's moving and it feels kind of like maybe a second chance for as i don't know how for how long you know but it's uh i mean do any of us know for how long for anything so it seems like that uh, point in music right now You know, I've been, I call it getting schmoopy. I've been getting schmoopy with a lot of my old music friends on the show, you know, celebrating milestone anniversaries, like the Simple Man anniversary with the Shinedown guys, or, you know, watching Sully Erna's documentary of the early days of Godsmack and all of these bands that, that I've been around for from the early, early days. And to see the way that, new metal or that whole era of music is kind of all coming back and the way that rock is having this resurgent, it doesn't surprise me that this is the moment that the X's have been reborn. There's so much going on in rock right now. There really is. You're, you're nailing it right on the head. It's unexplainable to me why my niece who is 22 years old is all about the X's puddle of mud you know uh freaking everything from that to earache to uh, not earache uh, earshot to the trust company to you know got smacked to sh- like all of it is new to her and i guess the only thing i can say is that the the bands that are her age they're just not doing that they don't it's a different kind of uh What's the right word for it? It just sensibility, I guess, you know, uh, we, we grew up in a different time. So how we've processed the world and how, what we, what we were doing at that time was a complete reflection of that time. That's the one thing I will say about our time was and all the bands around us, Lincoln park to every, you know, everybody was really experiencing the world and it was coming out. It all felt, like the right music at the right time for whatever reason. And and I think that that's what they're feeling because maybe, you know, it's funny. She's sorry. I'm, I had to plug my phone in. Um, but she's saying, she said something to me interesting. She said, you know, we need bands and music like this because we don't have any of our own. That's what she said at 22 years of age. And I went, Wow. That just shows you how much the world has really changed, you know, in the fact of how it's feeling, you know, and uh, how artists are trying to interpret this this time to be able to get people to feel what they feel as well. You know, so there must be some kind of a I can't presume to know what it is, but maybe there's a maybe there's some kind of a, an emotional gap. And, and maybe that's okay because I, look, kids are going through a really hard time. COVID was massive, grievous interruptus, right? So many kids didn't go to prom or get to graduate school, and this is all going to take a massive toll on them, you know, and and their in their emotional development. And uh, it's not their fucking fault, you know. It's like they're just going to have to deal with it, you know. And so I guess that maybe they're finding some of those questions and those feelings in the music that was around when I was creating music back then. That's the only thing I can think of for this resurgence. There's a sound and a feeling to it that they're, that they're relating to. Well, I think there's 
generations of music also cannibalize themselves too, right? We saw it with the 80s metal. We saw it with grunge. That that a phase of music gets to the point where it becomes the mainstream and then something has to come out that's different. And yeah. I think that there's an important music shift when it comes to rock because rock has had its ups and downs in the last 20-something years. And I think a lot yeah. of it is attributed to the success and the rise of hip hop. Sure. And what I'm seeing in hip hop now is that music is starting to cannibalize itself too. The way that every other big music phase cannibalizes itself where there's, it's not coming out of innovation the way that it was when it started. And that's getting set for a rebirth too. And in a new way where you get an artist to circle back to when we started talking like an Aaron Jones, or you start taking this music that has to change to evolve and move forward. And it feels like this whole new generation is starting to take all of these different flavors of music. I mean, we're, we're, you know, half a year from Lincoln Park being eligible for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Rage Against the Machine just got in. This, this generation grew up with hip hop as, as, you and I grew up with Aerosmith. Like, it's just yeah, the norm. Yeah. It's around. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're nailing it. It, it. it is cannibalizing on itself. And that's, you know, there. like, it's not that this, I think that this resurgence of post-grunge, grunge, whatnot is the next phase. But I, I do believe you're right. Like, the kids today are taking this feeling, you know, that happens from everything from Creed and, you know, Nirvana and, and who knows, maybe even us, but like Breaking Benjamin and all these other bands shutting down, da, 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 da. And they're, yes, they're absorbing it because it feels, it feels, the narrative feels different. The feeling of the chords is different. The way that the chords are working, which is ca- causing melodies to do certain things. And they're just ingesting all of it and they're going to use it to, I think spawn more organic kind of music. I'm starting to see it because I work in the studios all the time and, you know, more and more they might have a trap beat going, but they got a live bass going now. They got a live bass and, and there's mistakes and there's timing issues. So now it becomes human and it, and it becomes a little bit more, not so, uh, you know, loop based, you know, where everything is, the only thing that's organic is the person that's spitting over the track. Um, when you start getting live drums playing even to a trap beat, you've got more a more organic thing already maturing. And all of a sudden you added a distorted guitar to that. And now there's something else, you know, so. All music is better this- with a live band. Eminem was just in Detroit with an orchestra and it was fantastic. All music yeah. is better with a live band. It is. It's uh it it felt it felt like when we played that show, because it was just us manufacturing that in that moment. And it just it felt so freeing. Mistakes and all, warts and all. It just but it felt right and everything felt really uh, pure, you know, and and I think that that is something that is been lost and is starting to somehow find its resurgence, which is why all of this is happening again. Yeah, that's, that's it. It's a really exciting time for rock and roll. Um, Yeah. I'm hoping it's one of the good things, quote unquote, good things that is going to come out of COVID is, is just this wave of amazing creativity and wonderful music. I think it is happening. You know, it's, uh, as a person that created what I'm putting out now in COVID talking to many artists, I see it and I feel it. And I, I think that people are relating to that, that time um, because it was such a massive interruption for us all that we're now just figuring out how to kind of come out of the cave back into the world. But you can't do that without what you experienced for the last five years coming with you. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, I'm here for the ride, man. I'm so happy you guys are back together and working on music and 
hinting at shows and a tour and obviously all of the other music that you're working on with all of the artists that, you know, we're playing on the radio and that I have on the show all of the time. Um, it's impossible for me to talk to anybody without you coming up at one point or another. So I'm so happy that I finally got you on the show. I'm so glad to be here and, and honored to be here. You know, it's, it's this is this has been refreshing and amazing and your questions have been so good. And, uh, you know, I, I love being challenged at early 745 in the morning. <laughs> it's great. You know, like rock and roll knows no rest. So I, I thank you so much for taking the time and the interest to want to, to speak to me and um and i and i really hope that i get to see you and i hope that we get to play a show in boston and um yeah and, you know maybe relive the past a little bit i'm i'm on a bunch of stations around the country now and and i have promised zach that i will come back to nashville i came down a few years ago for the first time was expecting like longhorn cattle and belt buckles everywhere growing up in boston that was my idea of what nashville was like i was mistaken nashville yeah. is amazing and uh, zach has promised me that the next time i come to nashville that uh that we're gonna get together and i i i'm i'm coming it's gonna happen you gotta let me know when you're gonna do that because i'm i'm always there I, I go back in two and a half weeks to finish working on Daughtry's record. So I'm always there. I have a place out there. It would be great to see you. You know, here's what we gotta, here's what we gotta do together. We'll team up on Zach. Yeah. The, the Xies and, and, and Nixons have to do a show together. Yes. And I'll, and I'll tell you why, because the Nixons took the Xies out on their very first tour ever. They, they took, they took us across the country and showed us how to do it, you know, and, and, and here Zach and I are all these years later, writing buddies you know we toured together and 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 it's just i told him i said we got to do a, a reunion show you know that was done 20 years ago come on man so that's our that's our goal well when i went to nashville i i went to visit my friend who was in a big band in boston for a long time who works in nashville now and as soon as i tell you his name you're gonna go are you kidding me but i i went to go visit him at work and it was jay sims who's a really good friend of mine Oh, wow. <laughs> and I walk into Sienna Studios and I turn the corner and there's Marty and he's like, this is my, I'm like, I know who it is. You don't need to, you don't need to tell me who Marty Fredrickson is. I know who Marty is. So I got yeah. to tour Sienna Studios. And so the next time I got a lot of friends in Nashville, I got to come down there now. Yeah, it's amazing. It, that place is always, uh, you know, the thing about Nashville that's amazing, especially the studio that we work at, that's the studio I work at with Marty all the time. There's just the tr the people that are coming in and out of there. It's always like a scene. It's it's a great place to hang. There's always so many great records being made there. Um, you would never know as you're walking down the alley, you know, or whatever. You know, the Deftones will be in there at any given moment, or or Lenny Kravitz will be there, or you know, her her will be there. You know, she's ripping up solos or something like it. Just uh, you know, then I've got you know, A Rod and I are in the other room cutting leads for this record. You know, it's just. It's an amazing spot. Um, and Nashville's that way. Like, it's it's just this little quick hub where everybody is and everybody gets in everybody's business. Uh, you know, out here in L.A., it's so, so huge. And so, you know, everybody's just kind of separate. You're kind of forced into this melting pot there, which is, um, you know, it, it causes great connections, great creativity, uh, and great moments. I'm just going to bring so. all my microphones and set up in the Neil Young tunnels in the basement and then when you, you guys are just done writing songs for the day, I'm just going to grab all the bands and make them do interviews with me. That's the place you should do it. Yes. That's amazing you know about that because not very many people do know about that down there. I got that's the VIP the tour. I know what's going on down there. <laughs> that's right. The catacombs. <laughs> yes. That's where all the ghosts are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so good to see you. So good to see you too, Carrie. Thank you so, so much. I can't wait for you to hear the EP. And uh, I don't know, you know, you maybe you'll be hearing one of the songs here real soon. So on the radio. There he is, Scott Stevens. The new XE's EP, Closure, comes out this Friday, June 28th. And we are anxiously awaiting the arrival of new Daughtry music, new Hailstorm music, 
and so many of the other artists that the Four Horsemen are working on. Check the links in the show notes of this episode for the corresponding playlist. I make a playlist for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast that features all of my guest music and all the artists and songs that we referenced in the interview. You'll also find the link to episode 187 of the Mistress Carrie podcast featuring fellow horseman Zach Malloy. And of course, you'll find all of Scott Stevens' links, the Four Horsemen's links, the Exes links, and the Mistress Carrie links. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday, plus every weekday you get the sit rep. All of your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates in about five minutes. And you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. Join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern for my weekly streaming video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And of course, you can always find me on the radio. Get the details on all of that and more at mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.